Gabrielson, to Marcia Nelson and Wendy Nilsson for this recorder music this morning. Our speaker at this convocation is Dr. Roland Bainton, born in England, educated in Washington State. Professor Bainton has spent most of his time at Yale Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. He was, he was professor, or the Titus Street Professor of Ecclesiastical History in the Divinity School for quite a number of years, retiring in 1962. Many in this audience are acquainted with Professor Bainton through his book, Here I Stand, a biography of Martin Luther, for which he received the Abingdon Cokesbury Award in 1950, a biography very well received both by reviewers and readers. But of course, Professor Bainton has written a large number of books, I'm told over 30, and I thought that I would list them all and have you note them all before we leave this morning. Incidentally, if you are interested in, in purchasing one of his books, uh, they are available, I believe, in the lounge across the way, and, and you might uh, be interested in having his autograph on one of them uh, after the convocation lecture this morning. One of, uh, one of the areas to which he directed his attention in his writing is individuals, uh, particularly in the Reformation period, who were persecuted for their religious beliefs. One of Professor Bainton's reviewers wrote of his book on Michael Servetus that Professor Bainton's pages offer a constant challenge as we face modern problems and should make us ponder long his concluding admonition that the story of Servetus should demonstrate for us that our slogans of liberty need continually to be thought through afresh. More recently, Professor Bainton has addressed himself to Christian attitudes, to war and peace, love, and love, sex, and marriage, the women of the Reformation, as well as other subjects. <laughs> Professor Bainton, we are delighted to have you on the Augsburg College campus to enjoy your presence as well as to listen to what you have to say. His subject this morning is Erasmus, Professor Bainton. Time because I'm going to step. Oh, is it going to go with me? I think we could do it like this. Oh, all right, thank you. <clears throat> I am going to talk to you this morning about Erasmus, and someone asked me how, having written a sympathetic study of Luther, I could do the same for Erasmus, with whom he sharply differed. <clears throat> the answer is in part that I think in dealing with any man, one ought to try to find out why and how he behaved as he did. <clears throat> but to say that the men differed doesn't mean they differed on everything. I could perfectly well agree with both of them on the many subjects on which they agreed with each other. There was, however, a difference of circumstance in the writing of these books. The Luther was written in the period of McCarthy when I thought the great cry needed to be, here I stand. And the Erasmus was written in the period of student violence all over the country when buildings were being bombed. And here it seemed to me that we had a great need for one who had sufficient flexibility and openness to the new, that he wouldn't be a hard-boiled, rigid conservative. And on the other hand, a sufficient dedication to the tradition that he would not want to see all of our educational institutions wrecked. There was room for the man in the middle, uh, the man of moderation. And this was Erasmus in his own day. <clears throat> Erasmus would not leave the Catholic Church. Of course, Luther didn't want to either. He was put out. And if Erasmus had lived long enough, he probably would have been put out too. Uh, the reason why he stayed in the church was that he died 20 years before Luther did. <clears throat> Uh, but, but both of them wanted to stay inside and wanted to be critics, and one was expelled and the other remained. And Erasmus was a very vigorous uh, critic. Uh, 
uh, of the church. <clears throat> but uh, he deprecated the violent outbreaks against the church. Well, now to come to the man himself. He was a reformer. <clears throat> he wanted to reform the church and the whole of society, and to do so by restoring the glories of a past golden age. <clears throat> All the reformers of that period looked to the past. Today, the reformers generally wipe out the past uh, and start all over again. But then they all believed that there had been once a golden age which had been lost. They were in rebellion against the immediate past in terms of a return to a more remote past. And for Erasmus, it was the classical Christian origins, not the Jewish Christian. He wasn't very fond of the Old Testament because of all the wars of the Lord. He appreciated more the classical philosophers because of their dealing with political questions. Plato, Aristotle, Plutarch, Cicero, and so on. It was the classical Christian tradition which he would revive in order to reform church, state, and society. And the method was education. He believed that man was capable of being educated. The way to educate him was to make available for him the great writings of antiquity in the original languages and in translations. He spent most of his life as an editor and a translator, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> and the great tool of education was the printing press. No man worked so feverishly to take advantage of the technology of his generation as Erasmus. He kept running all over Europe to find manuscripts on the one hand and printing presses on the other. Uh, we shall find him in various places in the Netherlands. We find him in London. We find him in Oxford, uh, in Venice, in Bologna, in Rome, in Strasbourg, in Constance, in Basel. He said, if Ulysses was the wisest man because he visited so many cities, my horse is the wisest in Europe because he has attended so many universities. <clears throat> So Erasmus was the great traveler, looking for manuscripts, looking for books, and looking for printing presses. <clears throat> we don't know exactly when he was born, whether it was 1466 or 69, and the question a few years ago became very crucial in order to determine when to have the celebration. And the Swiss decided on 66, and the Dutch decided on 69, so as a result of this ambiguity, Erasmus got two celebrations. But there isn't any doubt that he was born uh, or that he was the illegitimate son of a priest. <clears throat> uh, his father was not irresponsible. That is to say, he recognized him and left some money for him. But of course, he couldn't bring him up. <clears throat> the mother had to take care of that. <clears throat> and there was another older brother, too, by the way. <clears throat> Uh, when <clears throat> Erasmus was six, uh, his mother sent him to the great school at Deventer in Holland, a great intellectual center, and also the center of a comparatively new monastic order, the Brethren of the Common Life. When they began, <clears throat> they had no vows, no lifelong vows. They lived in community, they engaged in devotional acts, <clears throat> in manual labor, and above all else, in teaching, and often planted their members in universities and schools all over Northern Europe. <clears throat> the book which emanated from that circle, the best known one, is The Imitation of Christ, attributed to Thomas Akempis. There are, I think, there are three notes, and you'll find them all in Erasmus. One, a lyrical devotion uh, to Jesus. Secondly, a great emphasis on following in his steps, the imitation of Christ. And third, an aversion to overly refined theological speculation. <clears throat> the imitation says the Trinity is better pleased by adoration than by speculation. And one of the brethren asked about the theology of the penitent thief. Christ said to him, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. But he hadn't been baptized. He'd never had the Lord's Supper. He'd never heard of consubstantiation or transubstantiation. 
And yet Christ said, you'll be with me in paradise. All he had to believe was that Christ could get him there. How little theology it takes to get you to heaven. <laughs> well, there's a good deal of that in Erasmus, too. He was brought up by the brethren then and had a great interest quite early in the classical and the Christian uh, writings. His uh, father and mother died when he was probably in the plague when he was uh, only 12. The guardian <clears throat> had perhaps misinvested uh, uh, the funds left by the father. Anyway, there was nothing by the time Erasmus was 16 and the question was, what next? The guardian thought that a boy with his tastes had better be a monk <clears throat> and wanted him uh, to uh, join the Brethren of the Common Life, one branch of whom in the meantime had gone in for vows because they were under such pressure from the other orders. Erasmus regretted later on that he hadn't joined the branch without vows. Well, why did he choose the one with vows? Primarily, I suspect, because they had a magnificent library. <clears throat> Luther went into the monastery to save his soul by good works and Erasmus to improve his mind by good books. <clears throat> uh, he joined the branch with vows and he was with them six years. He had some tilts with them over the propriety of studying the classics, but no fundamental uh, breach. They made him a priest. And in after years, whenever in the area, he always went back to see them. So there is no fundamental rebellion here. But still, after six years, he was restive. He probably read everything in the library. <clears throat> and the prior thought he'd be happier if he were secretary to a bishop, and he got him such a job. But the bishop didn't really need him. <clears throat> and he was a generous soul. He gave him a stipend to go to the University of Paris. Now here, of course, Erasmus studied the late scholastic theologians. <clears throat> and they were debating whether... If God had so wished, he might have been incarnate, not in the man Christ Jesus, but in a pumpkin or a donkey. Oh, bah, Erasmus would say. But it was a serious question. It was a part of a whole series of questions. And they all arose out of this. If God is all-powerful, can he do anything, absolutely anything? Can he make right wrong? Can he make black white? Can he make the past not to have been the past? Can he do something preposterous, such as becoming incarnate in a squash or a donkey? Are there any limits to God's power? Erasmus felt that there must be some self-imposed limitations by God on himself. If he's so absolute that there's no right or wrong, then power has corrupted even God. Let God be good. Now that comes up later on. And that, I think, was his deepest complaint with regard to the late scholastic theology. Well, he studied there six years and still hadn't taken his theological degree, and the bishop began to suspect he was becoming a professional graduate student. Uh, so he cut him off, and he had to earn some money. And like others in a similar situation, he took to teaching, tutoring. <clears throat> in that way, he had contacts with a number of uh, students, one of whom was an Englishman, Lord Monjoy, who invited him to come to England. And in the summer of 1499, they crossed the channel. We have the first letter which Erasmus wrote back to a friend in France. He said, you wouldn't know Erasmus. He has become a courtier. He rides in the chase. And if you knew the kisses of these English nymphs, you would fly over the channel like Daedalus, even if you had the gout. <clears throat> well, now, some have wondered whether Erasmus was demeaning himself appropriately uh, to his station as a young monk and as a young priest. But there are two things to remember. One, that kissing between the sexes on greeting was customary in England, but not in France. We know that from other sources. And the other point is that Erasmus had a marvelous capacity for adapting himself to the taste of those to whom he wrote, so that his letters are often more revealing of the person to whom he wrote than of himself. <clears throat> 
Now, the man to whom he wrote this letter, I mention him because we'll meet him again, was <coughs> Fausto Andrellini, an Italian, now more French than the Italians, uh, teaching literature at the Sorbonne, uh, a good deal of a gay blade, and very charming, and for Erasmus, charm covered a multitude of sins. Uh, this was the man to whom this letter was sent. We'll meet him again. But Erasmus certainly didn't spend very much time greeting the English nymphs. Uh, he quickly left the country house of his friend Lord Montjoy and went to Oxford and was working there very strenuously on his studies and staying in the house of the brethren, the order to which he belonged. Now here he met a company of very remarkable young men, some half dozen of them, I'll name only two, one was John Collett, who later became the Dean of St. Paul's, and the other was Thomas More, who became Sir Thomas and St. Saint, Saint Thomas. The association with these men gave a great stimulus to Erasmus' self-estimate. After all, he was the illegitimate son of a priest and a poor boy, and now he was treated with deference and affection by the science of the English aristocracy, men of substance and men of brilliance, Thomas More and John Collett. <clears throat> but this visit did more for him than enhance his self-esteem. He learned from them certain ideas, and one was the necessity of learning Greek. If he were to interpret the classical Christian tradition, he'd got to have Greek. Plato, Aristotle, Plutarch, all Greek. The New Testament, Greek. The early fathers, Greek. He must know Greek. Call it, <coughs> was sorry, he didn't know it. More had already made a good beginning. Erasmus resolved to devote the next few years to Greek. The other point was that they introduced him to the revival of Platonism, and more particularly Neoplatonism, taking place in Italy. Most of those young men had been in Italy. More hadn't, but he'd learned Italian. Now, the school of Pico della Mirandola in Florence, it was called the Florentine Academy, had revived Platonism and Neoplatonism. And the central doctrine here was the distinction between flesh and spirit, that is the physical component of man and the spiritual component. And the physical component was regarded as inferior and as an impediment. The body is a prison or even a tomb of the soul, and the way of religion is the way of emancipation from the things of the sense, so that putting all this aside in ecstasy one is caught up in rapture and united with the very being of the ultimate. Now, if you combine that with Christianity, and it had been done to a degree before, you're almost bound to get a disparagement of the external aids to religion. There'll be a disparagement of pictures because they come through the eye, of the sacrament because you have the bread and the wine through the mouth, of music because it's sensory coming through the ear. Now, Erasmus was never radical enough to call for the complete abolition of music and the sacrament for the images. Some of his followers were. We'll see that by and by. But he always emphasizes that the physical will do you no good. You don't need to wipe it all out. But unless it is accompanied by a spiritual experience, it is valueless. So his great cry was against externality in religion. And that fitted in with the teaching of the brethren, too, for the whole emphasis there is on the spiritual, though they don't disparage the flesh. Having come to this conclusion, Erasmus went back to France to see if he could find a Greek teacher. Well, he did get one, but he wasn't much of a teacher. And then Erasmus brought out a little publication which was to have an enormous uh, popularity. By the end of the century, it had had five or six translations into the vernacular. You must remember, Erasmus never wrote in anything except Latin. It was the learned language of the whole of Europe. You could go from Scandinavia to Calabria with Latin. You could go from Sweden to Spain 
And with cultivated men, you could communicate. You could go from Italy to Poland. Dürer was up in Poland. So Erasmus wrote for the learned world all over Europe and never wrote anything in his native Dutch. He wrote The Dagger of the Christian Soldier, Enchiridion Militis Christiani. <clears throat> it consists of <clears throat> inveighing against everything that is external in religion, the cult of relics, pilgrimages, and all that sort of thing. And he concludes in this way, Do you think you'll move God by the blood of a bull or by incense? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. You venerate the wood of the cross and have no regard for the mystery of the cross. You fast, refraining from that which does not defile, but you don't refrain from obscene conversation. You adorn a temple of stone. But of what use is this if the temple of the heart is full of abominations? With the mouth you bless, with the heart you curse. You enclose your body in a cell while your mind wanders over the earth. Creep not upon the earth, my brother, like an animal. Put on those wings which Plato says are caused to grow on the soul by the ardor of love. Rise above the body to the spirit, from the visible to the invisible, from the letter to the mystical meaning, from the sensible to the intelligible, from the involved to the simple. Rise as by rungs until you scale the ladder of Jacob. As you draw nigh to the Lord, he will draw nigh unto you. If with all your might you strive to rise above the cloud and the clamor of the senses, he will descend from light inaccessible and that silence which passes understanding, in which not only the tumult of the senses is still, but the images of all intelligible things keep silence. It's the Neoplatonic experience of ecstasy and rapture, where everything of the sense is abandoned, and one is united with the ultimate. And it is given in biblical language. Here's a combination of the Christian and the Neoplatonic tradition. This had an enormous effect. For 20 years, or for at least 10 years, Erasmus had great popularity even in Spain. <clears throat> then he got back to England again, and from England got a chance to go to Italy because the physician of Henry VIII was an Italian and he wanted his two boys to study at Bologna and was ready to pay Erasmus expenses if he would go along as their tutor and uh, instructor. Erasmus was supported, supported all his life uh, by uh, rich donors. There were no Ford or Guggenheim found or Danforth foundations then or even Fulbrights. Uh, you had to be your own money raiser. Erasmus said, in raising money for yourself, rub your brow so hard that it's so red that a blush won't show, and then go ahead and blow your own horn. <laughs> well, anyhow, somebody gave him, he got the money from this doctor, and with the boys, he went to Italy. When he arrived in Italy, they were going to Bologna, remember, they heard that Bologna was being besieged by the Pope. Well, now, the Pope was Julius II. Julius the Terrible, Giuliano il Terribile. He was a great despot of the Renaissance, <clears throat> a patron of arts and letters. He it was who started the present Basilica of St. Peter's. He discovered Bramante and Raffaele and Michelangelo. <clears throat> he was a great warrior. He was just like the other despots of the Renaissance. There was no Pope of the Renaissance distinguished for spirituality. Well, now, in the Middle Ages, the papacy had largely been supported by taxation on a strip of land called the Estates of the Church, called the Patrimony of St. Peter, Patrimonium Sancti Petri, which ran from Rome over the Apennines to Ravenna. Well, the Italian cities were whittling at this, and uh, Ferrara had taken a chunk, and Bologna had taken a chunk, and Venice was taking a chunk, and the Pope, at the head of his own army, decided that he would recover the patrimony of St. Peter's, and he marched on Bologna. Erasmus and the boys waited to see what had happened, and word came that the city had fallen. So they went on and arrived just in time to see the great procession, led by the white palfreys and all the dignitaries of church and state, carrying the Pope aloft to the church to give thanks to the Lord Jesus for this marvelous victory. <clears throat> Pope Julius playing Julius Caesar, said Erasmus. <clears throat>
And he went out to the countryside and saw the papal tax collectors already taking cows away from the peasants. And he never forgot it. <clears throat> After a year with the boys of Bologna, that assignment was over and money came from somewhere else, enabled him to go, enabling him to go for a year to Venice. Now, Venice had an amazing printing press, the printing press of Aldus Minucius. He had a household of 33 Greeks, all talking Greek. They'd come from Constantinople after the fall of the city. Of course, that took place in, 15, in 1453, and it was now about half a century, but many of these Greeks had settled in Italy or in Greek. And here they were, digging out Greek manuscripts, printing them in a marvelous script, translating them into Latin, eating together and all talking Greek. Here was Erasmus' chance to get a spoken knowledge of the Greek language. During that time, he roomed with a young Italian named Aleander. We'll meet him again. Aleander was a brilliant young man, 23 years old. He knew, of course, Italian and Latin, but he also knew Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic. Highly learned, very clever, and altogether delightful. Erasmus was almost as charmed by him as he had been by Thomas More. And we'll meet, we'll meet him again. Well, at the end of that year, Erasmus himself had brought out a great collection of proverbs called the Adagia. He just went through all the literature of classical antiquity, culling out proverbs, the quintessence of folk wisdom. Aristotle said what everybody agrees on is likely to be true. Therefore, the proverb, which is universal wisdom, may give you a clue to truth. Erasmus collected these, and he was responsible for much of the classical quotation that occurred in subsequent literature. Well, he finished that, and then he went to Rome. And the, one of the cardinals begged him to stay in Rome. But in Rome, a letter was awaiting him from England, from his old friend, Lord Montjoy. Come back to England. The golden age has dawned. Our prince, our marvelous prince, has become Henry VIII. You can't imagine the enthusiasm for Henry VIII at the beginning of his reign. A stalwart young man, a fine athlete, a great tennis player, <clears throat> uh, interested in music, uh, did a little composition himself interested in the classical literature, no great scholar, but he knew Latin well enough later on to write in Latin against Luther. They thought he'd be the great patron of arts and letters, and they were full of enthusiasm. Come back to England. The king wants you. He's written you in his own hand. He did. He sent a couple of letters in Latin to Erasmus. <clears throat> uh, Archbishop Warham will give you a living. Come back to England. <clears throat> Erasmus started out on horseback, of course, they, used, uh, they didn't use the rivers very much because they didn't have a, a Hertz uh, rent-a-horse system. <laughs> and when you got down at the end of the river, you wouldn't have a horse waiting for you, so it was best to ride him all the way. <clears throat> uh, that was slow traveling, but that had a certain advantage. It gave you a chance to think. Uh, so along the way, he developed a little fantasy, which he wrote out after he got to London and was staying in the household of Thomas More. He called it the praise of More, encomium moriae. Now, in Greek, moria means foolishness, so the praise of folly. Uh, in this little skit, folly uh, dressed in a woman dressed in uh, the garb of the fool uh, mounts the rostrum to give her lecture. She says, I'm responsible for the continuation of the human race. If people considered how much trouble it is to have a baby, they'd never have one, and if they'd have one, they'd never have another, but they don't think. They just go ahead. And so I keep the human race going. Folly is a lack of calculation, a readiness to take risks, to plunge and see, not know what's going to happen. It's folly is responsible for all great enterprises. Who'd ever start anything if he sat down and figured out how badly it might go wrong? 
Then folly suddenly becomes that absence of brutal candor which vitiates human relations. If a man thinks that his ugly wife is a Penelope, won't he get along with her better if he is not disillusioned? A little humbug is the lubricant of life. <clears throat> but then folly shifts her meaning, and now she becomes downright foolishness. <clears throat> the foolishness of a nobleman who wouldn't think of being a butcher but doesn't mind carving up a stag on the, at the, uh, on the hunting field. Uh, the folly of a merchant who will leave his family and risk his life to go to the ends of the earth to come back with a few red th threads or a pearl. Uh, the folly of a king who isn't content with the territory he has, but is always trying to acquire more. The folly of a friar who will wear such a filthy cowl that a ship's captain wouldn't put it on in a storm and thinks that by coming up to heaven in that rag, the Lord Jesus will give him a reward. The folly of a scholar who ruins his eyes and his health poring over old manuscripts like that Erasmus. Now then, does he think that scholarship is as foolish as all those other things? Or is he just throwing this out in order to uh, throw a sop to those whose gorge is rising? But at any rate, it's a transition to another definition of folly. The foolishness of God who chooses the weak things of the world to confound the mighty, the folly of the cross, a scandal to the Jew, a laughingstock to the Gentile, but the power of God unto salvation. And then the folly of the poet, of the seer, who, wrapped beyond all the senses, is lifted up in ecstasy and united with the ineffable. It is again the Neoplatonic vision of God combined with Christianity. That is this little tract on folly, so subtle in its shifts of meaning. Well, he stayed on then in England for two years, working in Cambridge, hard at Greek, and um, he was working like a mole underground. You could just see he was there only by the surface eruptions. <clears throat> uh, after a couple of years, he had to leave England because that glorious Prince Henry had gone to war on behalf of Pope Julius. Now, it came about in this way. Julius, after taking Bologna, attacked Ferrara and then Venice. But when he attacked Venice, then France came in to defend Venice, and England came over the channel to embarrass France. So by this combination, England was actually supporting the Pope. And Henry VIII was on the side of Julius II. And Henry so taxed England that the people who supported Erasmus weren't able any longer, so he had to go back to the Netherlands and live there in extreme poverty for a number of years. Well, that was 1511. In 1513, Pope Julius died. And then there came out an anonymous tract entitled, Pope Julius Excluded from Heaven. <laughs> the Pope arrives at the gate of heaven with a little, a little companion. He's in armor. And uh, he has on his breastplate the letters PM. Uh, he gets out his key and puts it in the gate of heaven. What the, what the devil? His companion says, maybe you got the wrong key. <clears throat> no, no, he said, it, it's the key of power. It used to work on earth. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, then uh, Peter hears this, and he comes and looks over the gate. He says, what a stench. He says, who are you? Don't you know who I am? P.M. Pestis Maxima, a big pest. <laughs> Pontifex Maximus, and who are you to talk to me? I'm a Ligurian Italian, and you're only a Jew. Uh, well, why do you care about uh, what country you belong to? I want my country to have the credit of me. Well, what have you done that is so creditable? <clears throat> I built up the papacy. I captured Bologna. You captured Bologna? Why? Was the ruler Bentivoglio a heretic? Was he a tyrant? No. Why then? 
I wanted Bologna for my son. Popes with wives and sons? Oh, you don't understand. <laughs> sons, not wives. <laughs> well, uh, tell me again, what have you done that I should let you in? I have built up the papacy. It's magnificent. You should see our processions. <clears throat> Drums beating, boys dancing, horses prancing, dishes steaming, and I carried aloft on the shoulders of my soldiers. It's magnificent. We didn't have anything like that in my day. <laughs> the job wasn't worth having in your day. <laughs> no, in my day, we had scourgings, imprisonments, crucifixions, and by suffering we conquered. Then you wait till next year till more of my soldiers die and come up here and we'll knock your gates down. Did Erasmus write that? He didn't say, I didn't write it. He said, how would anybody think I would do such a thing? <laughs> But Thomas More had a manuscript in his own hand. Now, of course, he might just have copied it. But Thomas More undertook to defend him and said, these are all the reasons why it isn't likely he would do it, but suppose he did. <laughs> well, Thomas knew the circumstances. Why would he ever suppose that he did if he knew that he didn't? A flat denial would have been better. Then there's another thing. There's a poem that is even worse. This poem makes a comparison between Pope Julius and Julius Caesar to the disadvantage of the Pope and says, the only thing lacking is another Brutus. <laughs> now, for a long time, it, there was doubt as to whether Erasmus wrote that, but a year or two ago, it turned up inside of one of his books in his own handwriting. But there is one curious point. There's one early edition with the initials F.A., Poet Laureate. Fausto Androlini, that Italian to whom he wrote that letter. So some have thought that Fausto did it. But the two were together in 1511 in France, and I think they may very well have collaborated because there's a lot of French detail in it that Erasmus wouldn't know as well as Fausto. And uh, Erasmus and Moore collaborated on the Utopia. So this kind of thing was quite common. I think there may have been collaboration. But it seems to me almost certain that Erasmus was responsible for shaping it up. But it's very dangerous ever to bring out anything anonymous and get suspected, because after that, you're suspected of every anonymous track that comes out. And Erasmus had to spend much of his life saying he didn't write this and he didn't write that. Well, he was doing more than putting out skits of this kind. He wrote a serious work on political philosophy, on the education of a Christian prince, a magnificent plea for peace, the complaint of peace. I'm sorry I haven't got time to analyze it, but it's one of the great classics of peace literature. And then, and this is his really his greatest work, well, the, an edition of, of the, all the letters of St. Jerome uh, from an improved text. And finally, and this is the great thing, for the first time in history, the New Testament in Greek, in print. In 1516, uh, printed in Basel. We have a first edition in the Yale Library. It wasn't perfect. He had only five manuscripts, and none earlier than the 11th century. He kept hunting more for the rest of his life and put out five editions, and we've got all of them in the Yale Library. <clears throat> but it was a great work, despite the fact that it needed improvement. In the first place, because it called attention to <clears throat> the uncertainty of the text. He left out, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. It was not in the text, in the manuscripts of Matthew. He said it probably crept in through the liturgy, and that's now the present opinion. He left out, there are three that witness in heaven, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. He said it's not in any of these manuscripts. Now that was the traditional text for the defense of the Trinity. He said, if you'll find it in any Greek manuscript, I'll put it back in the next edition. Well, they did. The manuscript was manufactured for the purpose, 
as he suspected, and we now know. But true to his word, he put it back. Now, he defended that on this ground. He said, it is in the Latin translation of St. Jerome. Jerome would never have made it up. It must have been in the Greek that he had. So, if it was in some manuscripts, in Jerome's manuscript and not in others, there must have been uncertainty even then. So, who am I to decide? What he didn't know was that it doesn't get into the manuscripts of St. Jerome until the 8th century. You can't use a translation to correct an original unless you've got the original of the translation. But in a footnote, he gave all of the evidence on the question. But Luther used the edition of 1519 without it. Uh, it was put back in 1522, and from that it went into all of the English versions and was taken out only recently by the Revised Standard Version. But all of this brought attention to the problems of the text. Next, the problems of translation. <clears throat> Uh, the Vulgate said, <clears throat> do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Erasmus translated it, be penitent, and then just repent. And that undercut the text for the sacrament of penance. And there are many other points of translation too. And finally, he wrote paraphrases of all of the Gospels in which uh, he gave a sort of a popular exposition of their meaning. And I'll give you just a single example, the prodigal son. <clears throat> and when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go unto my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned before heaven and before you, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose. And while he was a long way off, his father saw him, the one who had the greater love did first despise the other. And the old man ran. And the boy began his little speech, Father, I have sinned. And his father cut him off, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and called for the ring and the robe and the fatted calf. Now remember, that father is God. Erasmus was now 50 if he was born at the right time to be 50. <clears throat> and at the peak of his career, he had more friends in high places all over Europe than probably any other man. The emperor had made him a counselor. The king of France invited him to Paris. Rulers, bishops, cardinals were all inviting him. <clears throat> he was at the peak of his influence. And in 1517, Luther posted his theses. Erasmus sent a copy to Thomas More and said, I don't see much that's wrong with it, except he's been a little tart on purgatory, because Luther said, the Pope has no jurisdiction over purgatory, and if he does, he ought to empty the place free of charge. <laughs> <clears throat> that's all he could see that bothered him. And... <clears throat> When there was a great cry against Luther, Erasmus wrote to Frederick the Wise, Luther's prince, and said, Luther is a good man. He should be convinced, not coerced. And you, as his prince, are responsible for seeing to it that he has a fair hearing. It's Erasmus who said that to Frederick the Wise, and that's just what Frederick did. Well, you know, of course, that the papacy dallied and Luther had the summer of 1520 to come out with three great tracts. One was the address to the German nobility, in which he spoke of all of the financial exactions and various other faults of the papacy, and Erasmus didn't object to any of that. The only thing he criticized was that Luther called the Pope Antichrist. Oh, come, man, not all popes are Antichrist. Well, of course, Luther didn't say they were. He said the institution was. Then came the tract on the sacraments, in which Luther denied, among other things, transubstantiation. <clears throat> Erasmus, because Luther, Luther said, there's no change in the elements. Well, then what does happen? There's no change because Christ's body is everywhere. It pervades all reality. Well, in that case, what's special about it? <clears throat> 
What's special is that God has ordained two modes of self-disclosure, one the preaching of the word, the other the administration of the sacrament. And when the priest says, this is my body, the bread and the wine are the same, but our eyes are opened and we behold him where he is. Luther universalized the presence. Erasmus said, if the church says there's transubstantiation, all right, there's transubstantiation, but remember, it won't do you a bit of good unless you feed on Christ in your heart. Luther universalized, Erasmus spiritualized. But when Erasmus read Luther, he said, I think the breach is irreparable. I don't think it was for him, but I think he thought that the church wouldn't come to terms with that. Well, then, of course, came the Diet of Worms and Luther's magnificent stand, and he was put under the ban of the church and the empire. And Erasmus said, this is absolutely outrageous. Well, Erasmus at that time was in the Netherlands, and here the persecution of the Lutherans began because the Emperor Charles was the local prince there and not merely the emperor. So by his local authority, he began the prosecutions. And the man who was sent to push the prosecutions was Aleander, that old friend of Erasmus with whom he had ruined in Venice. They had a meeting, and it was very cool. Then who should turn up to see Erasmus but Ulrich von Hutten, H-U-T-T-E-N, a German nationalist who wanted to convert the Holy Roman Empire into a German national state comparable to England, France, and Spain. And he thought the man to do it would be the emperor. And he came to Erasmus to get a letter of introduction to the, to the emperor. And Hooten said, this is going to mean war, because the German bishops will never give up without a fight. So we must get the emperor to fight the German bishops. And the pope. The emperor, fight the pope, said Erasmus. You'll never get the emperor to do it. As a matter of fact, in a few years, the emperor's troops sacked Rome, but not in order to create a German national state. Erasmus would hear nothing of it. <clears throat> he wouldn't line up with Aleander to prosecute the Lutherans, and he wouldn't line up with Hutton in order to fight the Pope. <clears throat> the, the church began to turn against Erasmus, and when he went to church, the, minister, the priest digressed from his text to denounce Erasmus, and one priest said, if I could get my teeth into the gully of Martin Luther, I wouldn't hesitate with bloody mouth to come to the sacrament and partake of the body of our God. <sighs> said Erasmus, that's too much. He said, I left the Netherlands to avoid being turned into an inquisitor. And he went to Basel. Once in Basel, a pope, a new pope, an old friend, a Dutchman, Hadrian, invited him to Rome. Erasmus said, if I go to Rome, the Lutherans won't read me. If I stay in Basel, I can mediate. Then who turned up but Hutten? Hutten had secured not the help of the emperor, but of a German leader of mercenaries, and they attacked the archbishop of Trier, and they'd been beaten, and Hutten, as a refugee, turned up in Basel and wanted to see Erasmus. And Erasmus sent him money privately, but would not have a public interview, because if he did, he'd close the door to the Catholics. He wouldn't go to Rome. He would close the door to the Lutherans. He wouldn't talk to Hooten in any public way. It would shut the door on the Catholics. Then Hooten came out with a blast. I'm stupefied and shaken to know what's happened to you, who used to de demote... You were once ready to demote the Pope. You invade against the cesspool of Roman crimes. You detested bulls of indulgence and you damned ceremonies. And now you've sold out to the Pope. <clears throat> you say all this is creating tumult. Do you think there can be Christianity without tumult? <clears throat> Lift up your voice. Cry out. You say Luther throws the apple of discord. Anyone who proclaims the gospel throws the apple of discord. Haven't you said that if Luther goes under, the gospel will perish? How can you oppose? I would never have thought this of you. I would have sworn that you would stand to your post. I believed you would be unshakable for truth. I grieve over your defection. Erasmus replied, I believe in listening to both sides. I love liberty. I will not. I cannot serve any faction. I have said that all of Luther's teaching cannot be suppressed without suppressing the gospel. 
But because I favored Luther at first, I don't see I'm called upon to approve of everything he said since. I've never called him a heretic. He never did. I have complained of dissension and tumult. And at the same time, I've always deplored tyranny and vice in the church. Let us not devour each other like fish. Why upset the whole world over paradoxes? The world is full of rage, hate, and wars. What will the end be if we employ only bulls and the stake? It's no great feat to burn a little man. It's a great achievement to persuade him. Well, Hooten died the next year. And now great pressure was brought to bear on Erasmus to come out against Luther. The Pope wanted him to do. Henry VIII wanted him. Francis all said, you're the man. Come out against Luther. Erasmus said, oh, I don't want to deprive others of the honor. He wrote to Spingley, either I won't write against him, or if I do, what I say they won't like. But finally, he knew he'd got to disagree with Luther on something if he wanted to stay in the church, and he did want to stay in the church. But he paved the way very carefully. He came out with a tract on liberty, in which he inveighed against all coercion and persecution. And he came out with a tract on the Apostles' Creed. He catechizes a Lutheran on it and finds that he believes every bit of it. All right, anybody who believes all the Apostles' Creed is not a heretic. Luther is not a heretic. But I do disagree with him on one point, namely the freedom of the will. <clears throat> now, really, I don't think the debate was so much on the freedom of the will as on predestination. Because Erasmus said, if God elects some before they're born to be saved and others to be damned, he's a tyrant. And Luther said, who are you to pass your moral judgments on God? You needn't think you're the first man to be troubled by this more than once I've been cast down to the very abyss of desperation. We won't understand this until we have the light of glory, but you're not to pass judgment on God. Let God be God. And Erasmus said, let God be good. It's the old question again. Can God do absolutely anything? Well, they didn't come to an understanding. There was little contact after that between Erasmus and Luther, but continuous contact with Melanchthon. And once when Melanchthon was near Basel, he wrote to Erasmus and said, I would have liked to have come to have seen you, but I thought I might embarrass you, the way Hooten did. And Luther, Erasmus replied and said, I'm sorry, I wished you'd come. But now in the meantime, Erasmus was in Basel. He had left the Netherlands. He was in Basel. In Basel, a more radical form of, of reformation was underway, smashing the images, destroying the organs, <clears throat> <clears throat> celebrating the Lord's Supper as only a memorial, and wanting to compel all the people in the city to go to a Swinglian service or leave Basel. Well, there was a riot. The mob took over, and they enacted all of these decrees. Erasmus protested, and the leader said, but didn't you teach that the images themselves are of no value? Didn't you teach that the music has is, is gone wild with its elaborations? Didn't you say that the sacrament is of no value unless it be of the Spirit? Yes, 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 but I didn't say coerce people against their convictions. I didn't say drive them out of town if they unless they celebrate the Mass? No. So when this decree passed, Erasmus said, I go. And he left and went to Freiburg in Breisgau. It was a quiet town, but the news from without was disquieting. The news came that Bergkamp, one of his good friends and disciples in Paris, had been burned at the stake by the Catholics. And why? Because he had translated Erasmus. Well, after a few years, Basel react, relented a little bit, and Erasmus came back and settled down to more of his editing. But the news from without came that in England, at the behest of that once glorious Prince Henry, Erasmus' old friends, Cardinal Fisher and Thomas More, had been sent to the stake. Thomas More. More than the very half of me. England has never seen their like and never will again.
But Erasmus still hadn't lost his faith in education, and at the very end he put out a treatise on how to train ministers to preach and to educate, because he said, if you can teach elephants to dance and lions to jump through a hoop, it ought to be possible to teach preachers to preach. <laughs> and just before the end, he put out a little tract on preparation for dying in which he said, there are those who have had all the sacraments of the church and whose bones are buried beneath the altar, whose souls are in hell, and there are those who have had none of the rites of the church who are numbered with the godly in heaven. When the end came for himself, three friends came in, and he began to twit them as Job's comforters and ask them what they'd done with their sackcloth and ashes. But then he began to wander. It has been said that no man is profound in religion who does not express it in his native tongue. In that case, Erasmus was profound once. He began in Latin. Misericordia, misericordia, miserere mihi domini, misericordia, miserere mihi. And then in Dutch, liefer Gott, dear God. The lights appeared to have gone out. He did not know that Luther would carry on his biblical scholarship, Erasmus, Melanchthon, his spirit of mediation, Swingley and the Radicals, his emphasis on spirituality, Sebastian Frank and Castello, his arguments against persecution, and that the Anglican Church would be built upon his spirit of moderation. Nor did he live to see that after 300 years, the dialogue which he desired never to, have, never to be closed has at last been reopened. God grant that we may not take so long to resolve the controversies of our generation.